Hello and welcome to Airtime, the ITV News podcast. This is where we take the opportunity to look in more detail, behind the scenes, if you like, at the big stories. And we also look at the mechanics of how those stories are reported. And to be honest, they don't come much bigger at the moment, do they, than the royal story. And who better to talk to me than our royal editor, Chris Shipp. Welcome. Hi, thank you for having me. This is a strange kind of cross fertilisation of yes. Royal Rota and Airtime. Of course, so, uh, I normally sit in your chair when yeah, we're doing yeah. the Royal Rota, <laughs> asking other people questions. I'm slightly nervous about yeah. what you're going to ask me. So. I want you to relax. Right. I want you okay. to, to, to relax and tell me all about it. It has been an incredibly busy couple of years since you took on this brief, hasn't it? It has in a way. I mean, a lot of people said when I took the job, oh, is it a part-time job? Surely there isn't a full-time job in covering the Royals. But actually, just look at the things that we've had You know, since I took over. We had the Duke of Edinburgh's retirement. We've had uh, Harry and Meghan's uh, romance and then subsequent engagement and then wedding. Um, William and Kate have had Louis, uh, Harry and Meghan just recently had Archie. There's been, what, three, four royal weddings in the time I've done it now as well. Obviously, the one that everyone remembers of recent times is Harry and Meghan's this time last year. But it has been phenomenally busy. Yeah. Mm. It, what is the point of royal reporters nowadays, royal editors? I mean, some, peop some people I think are quite vocal about it. Who cares? Who's Absolutely, yeah. Why are you doing for you to come from the politics brief, which mm. you did, which some people might say very serious, very important mm. to come to Royal, was it a difficult choice to make? It wasn't for me, actually, because I mean, I'd, I'd done politics for a reasonable a number of years and it was time to sort of go and, and, and do something else. But in a way, there were some similarities there, you know, because the, the Queen, of course, sits at the very you know, top of our, our democracy, if you like. It's a constitutional monarchy and all the rest of it. And, and you know, even in politics, we were dealing with the Queen, like when the Prime Minister went to see the Queen and came back again. It might happen in the next few days. Who knows? Um, so it was a very, it's a fascinating part of, uh, of our makeup, if you like, and the, the royal family have been there for hundreds of years. They are still there. Some people, you know, legitimately say we shouldn't have one, we should be a republic. And that's a, a valid argument and one that's worth exploring. Um, but while they exist, while they are there, while they are part of our constitutional makeup, um, they need to be reported on not only what they're doing, the causes that they're bringing attention to, um, you know, and, and actually what they're doing for UK PLC, because don't forget, this is this is brand Britain. You look at Windsor on the day of the royal wedding last year. That was being beamed all around the world. And it couldn't have been better, could it? You remember, you were there. It's an amazing Sunny day, yeah. castle, pomp and pageantry. It's Britain at, beautiful its, princess. at its best, if Actually, you Absolutely. Like, yeah. And I mean, what sort of advert was that for Britain? It was fantastic. And, you know, you only have to talk to people in Windsor who know what happens after a royal wedding. They get an influx of visitors. So, you know, there's, there are many interesting parts. But for me, I think what I enjoy most about it is actually... Uh, delving deep into the causes that they bring attention to. One of my favourite subjects is the Invictus Games, for example, something that Harry founded in 2014. Uh, my first experience was Toronto in Canada. Um, and, and just the way in which that tournament brings together very seriously injured or mentally uh, injured people and yet it brings them together in a way in which, you know, nothing else could. It, it brings them back into a family. And plenty of people said to me when we did the Invictus Games, this saved my life. Yeah. And when you think about it in those terms, you think, well, there's not much more important things than that. And, and that's why I enjoy you know, covering this beat. And you definitely don't have to be a monarchist, do you, to approve of the Invictus not Games? Not at all. I, think, I, mean, you, I mean, everyone sort of says, oh, you, you're the royal reporter. I didn't know you were a monarchist. I mean, we report accurately and fairly. And I suppose that's the difference. Now the royal family have got their own social media channels and famously Harry and Meghan have got this Instagram account with eight million, probably since I've come into the <laughs> studios at nine now. But I mean, they can reach people directly. But... We, and they don't need to come through us if you like, but, but we are still the, the sort of branch of the media that does stuff accurately and fairly. Um, we're and not, objectively? And objectively, we are not there to be their, their, their PR arm. We are there to report on what they're doing and when we need to criticise them, uh, we will. Um, so I think we bring, uh, with the reporting, a level of trust, well that's what I hope we bring mm. to it, um, that perhaps you won't get from their direct channels because clearly they're, prom you know, they're promoting their own work. We are reporting accurately, fairly and objectively on what they do. It's interesting because I, I obviously follow you on Twitter and there is quite a lot of criticism, isn't there, of mm -hmm. the royal, royal editor role on there. And you're always quite robust and you come back at people and you say, well actually interesting you say that, but you know, X, Y and Z. And you do defend your... Well, your objectivity and and, and and the importance of what you and do. And you know, Twitter is a very how should you put this angry space at times. <laughs> yeah, and it's been particularly um, uh, 
angry space f during that period uh, around the, the, the Duchess of Sussex's pregnancy. Now, um, there are there, there, there's an element on Twitter that are very vocally supportive of Meghan Markle, as she was, uh, the Duchess of Sussex, and there are those who are vehemently against her. I mean, that's people's choice. I mean, we, we can't you know, make up their minds for them. It's our job, literally, to continue on that central path of reporting accurately and fairly on what she does. Has there been some criticism of Meghan? Yes, there has. Um, is it true to say um, that everything that she does is amazing and wonderful? No, it isn't. But that there is, it's our job to actually uh, report accurately and fairly on what they do. And hopefully that's what we do time in, time out. The game is changing, though, isn't it, with social media? And you touched on that. Mm. I mean... They have 8 million followers on Instagram. Arguably, they don't need you at all. They don't need to keep the television reporters happy remotely, do they? So how how does the dynamic work? How, I mean, explain explain to, you know, civilians yeah. who aren't used to dealing with these various palaces. What, what are all the different palaces? What do they do when people are critical of Kensington Palace? What exactly... Do they mean by that? You know. Okay, so so actually, if you're starting at the very top, the most senior palace is St James's Palace. Um, actually, no one resides there, but that is always the most senior palace. But um, w in our job, we refer to BPC, HKP, and I haven't got one for Sussex's yet, but SR Sussex Royal. But anyway, if I go through the Buckingham Palace is where the Queen resides, obviously, uh, and it is through Buckingham Palace that we talk to her communication secretaries. Uh, we sometimes have conversations with her private secretaries and other royal courtiers around there. Um, the next one down, if you like, would be Clarence House. Clarence House is where uh, Prince Charles, the Prince of Wales and Camilla, Duchess of Cornwall uh, live. So they have their own separate communications function. They have their own separate office um, after that Kensington Palace. Interestingly, was where until about a few months ago, both William and Kate and Harry and Meghan lived. And that palace dealt with both of those couples. As you know, and has been reported, that has now split. So Kensington Palace now just deals with uh, the Duke of Cambridge and the Duchess of Cambridge. That in itself is quite interesting because at some point in the future, Prince William is going to be the next Prince of Wales. When his dad is king, he's going to be the heir and therefore the Prince of Wales. So I think what we're seeing there is 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 a lot of focus on, on him and him projecting ahead to what sort of Prince of Wales he wants to be. We all know what sort of Prince of Wales his dad is, mm. um, that's been well documented. So that's been a significant change. And then you've got the Sussexes. Now, whilst they are um, perhaps, you could argue, the most high profile of all the royals at the moment, they come under the wing of, of Buckingham Palace. Um, they weren't allowed to have their own autonomous household. And why was that? That, well, you'd have to ask the palace. Oh, OK. So, so um, there, there, there is some speculation that the Queen wanted to keep an eye on, on, on this uh, young and very dynamic royal couple and therefore they kept them in the fold. For, so, for example, Buckingham Palace will sit here. Underneath that, yes, you've got the Sussexes, you've got like the Duke of York's office, you've got Princess Royal, the Princess Anne's office. So that's sort of where they sit. They don't have their own autonomous household. I mean, we think they wanted one. We think they were pushing to have one. But in the end, it was decided for whatever reason that uh, that both Harry and Meghan should sit within Buckingham Palace. And so uh, therefore, their communications chief reports to Buckingham Palace's communications chief. OK, so so objectively, they're not given the same um, independence then as as the Cambridges and obviously... It's, yeah, it's for example, the Cambridges yeah. don't have to report to Buckingham Palace. Okay. Prince of Wales doesn't have to report to Buckingham Palace in, in, in that way. The Sussexes do, and that is the slight difference that they have. But then Harry is, a, you know, he is... He's uh, the younger you know, son. He's the younger son, and, and therefore much further down. He's number six in the line of succession, and little baby Archie's number seven. Yeah, OK. And what do you make... And do you give any credence to these stories of of heightened competitiveness and, you know, enmity between these different well, palaces, stroke factions, whatever? I, I mean, is that something you would be able to comment on or is there a part of you that always has to hold back and say, well, I... No, I think if we're asked about it, we'll talk about it. And, OK, and go on. Then, so, it, I just, so we'll talk about it. I mean, uh, basically, I mean... Every family has tensions. I mean, I don't know whether you have it in yours or in mine, none, actually, but no, every family will tell you that there are tensions. Sometimes it's between the siblings, sometimes it's between the parents yeah. and the child, sometimes it's between the, you know, the aunties and uncles, whatever. And that, you know, the royal family, to that extent, is mm -hmm. not any different. Um, however, they live their life in a much more public way than the rest of us. So therefore, when there are tensions, and they do surface from time to time, and they have surfaced recently, um, that gets a lot of attention. Mm. 
The way in which a lot of the tensions were reported between the Sussexes and the Cambridges was all done through the prism of the women uh, between Kate and Meghan. And that's an and old actually, narrative. Though, it's isn't an it? old narrative. Really I mean, is. you can go back through time and look at showbiz couples or political couples, and everyone always talks about the women arguing. Female newsreaders, apparently, exactly. we're all at each other's it's throats much, as well. Yeah. Much better to, to talk about, you know, a cat fight, if you like, yeah. um, or, or, or girls fighting with their stilettos, whatever narrative or. And who's wearing know, what and how thin exactly, they are or how exactly, whatever. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, the truth really is that there's been a little bit of, a, um, of an issue between the two brothers, between William and Harry. The way I explain that is because I think after the death of their mother, we, we all know how awful that was for them. Uh, William was 15, Harry was 12. Um, we as a nation have always given them the label of the boys, plural S, mm. the brothers. Um, they're the best of friends. They came together when, when after the death of my mother, which is true. But also don't forget, they're also very competitive. They both went to Eton, they're alpha males. Um, uh, siblings do have rivalry. Every family will know that. Um, and therefore, there has been a little bit of tension between the two of them. It's not quite clear what started it, but, you know, there's many things that could have started it. But you know, there are new relationships that started with Harry and Meghan, for example. There are new projects. Um, you know, uh, perhaps we shouldn't get into, into that sort of level of detail. But there was an issue between William and Harry, it was written as a problem between the wives. That actually isn't true. We're told it's slightly better now. We're told that you know that they've been having a conversation after Archie was born. They've been in to see the new house where Harry and Meghan live now in Frogmore Cottage on the Windsor Estate. We're told that you know I think the phrase um, a royal aide told me recently is that they're back on track. Um, okay, it, it remains to be seen, but. Yeah. You know, they're now on different courses. William is on this course, as we just mentioned, to become king. Harry is on this very different course with this very dynamic, different um, wife um, who brings something entirely different to the royal family. Uh, and so many people say, talk about the positives of that, you know, not just the difference in terms of um, her race, her mum's black, her dad's white, for anyone who doesn't know, she's from America, she's been married before, she's had her own career, she's been an actress. Very successful Absolutely woman different. in her own right. Exactly actually, very successful. She? And she brings something fresh, dynamic and different to the royal family. And and um, I think a lot of people think that that is exactly what the royal family needs. Yeah, but uh, but but also... People may say that, but other people are just saying, you know, get back in your box, aren't they? There are a lot of, of course, traditionalists yeah. who are very critical of this idea of her, you know, subsuming Harry is one of the narratives, isn't it? And doing things her own way and not paying due respect yes, to you know, and, our traditions and our ways. You know, and, and, and if, you know, the Duchess of Sussex is writing her own Instagram posts and is doing she? things is differently. She? Well, I mean, we suspect she is. Yeah. Um, and or, or at least at the very most deciding on the on the content in those posts. Well, why should we criticise that? Why are we not embracing someone who's actually taking control of, of what she's doing and if feels empowered enough to to want to, to do that rather than leave it to her staff? But, but, so, is but, there... but naturally, because it's Megan, because she is different, because she's from America, everyone, I think, automatically sees that as a criticism rather than a positive but attribute. I, and I hear what you say, but I suppose what what fascinates me is, yes, she's different and yes, she's dynamic, but is that something that can sit comfortably with the royal family? I mean, arguably, we saw a previous princess who was dynamic and different tried to do things her own way, and that didn't end, uh, uh, as we know, well, you know, in, in terms of the divorce and stuff. I, I just... The royal family is, by its very nature, such an old-fashioned, completely hierarchical yes, structure. Of course, yes. How does modernity fit with that beyond, you know, moving into the crowd and chatting to people and, you know, wearing a different style of coat? Or, you're, you know what I mean? If you're going to introduce an element of difference into the royal family, you're always going to, to rub up against some opposition somewhere. The courtiers um, are always cited, of course, and, you know, and, and But, you know, I think the courtiers are slightly different to what they used to be maybe in the sort of 30s and 40s. They're not all ex-military. They're not all sort of white and from private school anymore. The men with moustaches, as the they were with called in the, in the crowd. And look what happened um, with, with the Duke of Edinburgh and the men with moustaches. He was then the new entrant. He was the one who wanted things to change. He was the one that wanted to shake up things at Buckingham Palace. You could call him the disruptor of mm. the 1950s. 
Um, in the same way that you could say that Diana was the disruptor in the 1980s and 90s, and perhaps, you know, uh, Meghan, the Duchess of Sussex, could be uh, a disruptor now. Although she's slightly lower down, you know, the Duke of Edinburgh was married to the Queen at the very yeah. top, and um, Diana was married to the heir to the throne. But I, I think that that element of disruption is actually quite good, because the royal family does have to move. But whilst it's... Um, Whilst a lot of people are saying that with all the political instability we've got at the moment, it's really nice to have that um, stability at the very top um, mm. from the royal family. It also has to move with the times. And, and one of the, some of the things you read about the Queen is that she's actually much more open to change in her older years. She's 93 now, don't forget, mm. um, than she ever was when she was 30 or 40. So um, change happens. It happens very slowly, but... You know, it definitely happens, and it happens all the time. And, of course, the, 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 the big event that none of us... We all rehearse and we all do our homework on it, but none of us would wish it to happen, is that the Queen will, in the end, be succeeded by Charles. And she is an elderly lady, a very elderly lady. And, yes. you know, that it's all going to change again, isn't it? I mean, how do you see that transition working? Well, I think we're seeing that, really, that transition before our eyes at the moment. Don't forget, I mean, when the Duke of Edinburgh retired a couple of years ago, that coincided with Prince William giving up his job as an air ambulance pilot and doing full-time royal work. Now, a lot of people said at the time, full-time royal, what does that mean? Um, you know, is it a real job? Um, you know, but he does his duties as a member of the royal family now full time. He's not focused on, on, on air ambulance. And you know, to be fair, let's give him his due. Doing that job, uh, seeing some pretty distressing scenes that he saw when he uh, worked uh, for the air ambulance and previously for the uh, RAF search and rescue in North Wales. Um, that's helping shape his his opinions, help him form views now. And uh, personally, I think it's positive that a future king is seeing mm. things like that. However, the back to the point I was making about the transition. So the Duke of Edinburgh retired. Prince William uh, came on full time. The Queen is doing less and less. She doesn't travel anymore. The Prince of Wales is therefore the most senior member, travelling member of the royal family. For example, when we went to Cuba a few weeks ago, a historic visit. No member of the royal family has ever been to Cuba since Fidel Castro, um, his revolution in 1959. Um, you know that's a very significant moment because it we are sending as the uk the most senior member of the royal family who travels in this case it was the prince of wales uh to cuba now in the old days that would have been the queen i mean i'm, I'm quite yeah. sad that i've missed out on any yeah. uh, queen tours i've never had them since i've been doing this job for a couple of years she never travels abroad now you know who knows she might one day go to brussels on the eurostar but um, <laughs> I mean, at the moment she has not left the uk since a trip to malta in I forget when, 2014, 15, yeah, something it was an like anniversary that. thing, wasn't it? Or yeah. something I seem to remember. I, I, don't, I think it was a, a Chogham, a head, uh, Commonwealth Heads of Government oh, meeting yeah. in, in Malta. So she has not been, she has not travelled abroad since then. And, and I think, and she's increasingly finding it difficult to to do these visits. Um, she went to, you might remember last year, she went to Cheshire with Meghan. It was meant to be the yes. sort of queen taking Meghan under the shoulder. They went on the train, the train spent overnight. There's a lot of criticism about the cost of the royal train. I mean, how else do you expect, uh, you know, a 93 year old to get to Cheshire for nine or 10 o'clock in the morning, um, for example? So the fact is, as you, as you rightly point out, an elderly lady just turned 93, um, she can only do less and less, not more and more. Yeah. And therefore, this is the transition that we're seeing now. And one day she family. won't be doing it at all. Um, and Charles will be king. Yes, and actually there is some talk that perhaps um, we might even have a regency for the first time since, you know, testing my history now, 1812 mm -hmm. or something, mm -hmm. uh, since the Prince Regent, um, when George III was um, mentally unstable. Yes. Um, now, it, it, you do read, um, th th there's a book written by a, a fellow royal correspondent of ours, Robert Jobson of the Evening Standard, who says that at the age of 95, the Queen is going to hand over all responsibility to Charles. She's still going to be the head of state. She's still going to be the Queen. And he will therefore be a Prince Regent figure. Now, the palaces don't talk about that. They never want to talk about transition or the future in that sense. And so she said she'll never abdicate, of course. All I'm saying is that. it, that's a possibility coming yeah. down the track. Um, she's never going to abdicate. She said that on, on that tour to uh, South Africa in 1947. And she was a 21 or something? Yes, she, yes. She, she must be 47 because she was born in 26. There we are. There we go. Good, That'll we got this. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, My maths and your history. Yes, yeah, so, so um, you know, so I, I, therefore this transition is happening at, at the moment. And so things are going to change coming down, down the track. Yeah. Um, and that change, I think, will probably accelerate as the Queen gets older and older. Mm. And when that day does come that 
you know, there we have the royal funeral and state funeral and so on. That is an enormously important event to get right in terms of television, isn't it? Yes, uh, for all of us, I think um, it will be a it goes without saying an historic moment. Yes. Um, it will be a moment, I think, when this country will pause and take stock. I think we all take the Queen for granted. She's been the head of state for all of our lifetimes. I think I worked out the other day, you have to be something like 78, 79 to remember any other monarch other than the Queen, mm. to, to even remember George VI uh, as, as the King. It will be a huge moment for this country. Um, I often tell the story that when, when the Queen Mother died in 2002 um, and she was uh, laying in state in, in the Great Hall at, yes. uh, in the houses, uh, in the Palace of Westminster, the queue to see her went out of the Great Hall, through a couple of the parks, over the River Thames, back along the South Bank, all the way to, you know, towards Tower Bridge. Anyone who doesn't know the geography of London, that's quite some distance. Um, yeah. and, and that was for the Queen Mother. People were was, waiting for hours. That was for the say. Queen Mother, and she was only ever, if I can say the word only, a Queen consort. She was never the Queen. Um, so one wonders, you know, what would happen uh, if and when that moment happens. We are a different society now. We're, we're less deferential. Um, you know, that we're, would younger people want to go and see the Queen laying in state? Who knows? We don't know what will mm. happen. I'd still think how it will be a huge moment for this country. Yeah, I think so too. And then we have King Charles. He will presumably call, be called Charles, yeah, or maybe again, he'll be called something a, else. There's a lot of talk about that. You know, you know, famously, the, the, the Queen's father, Bertie Albert, took the name George, George VI, because he was worried about continuity yes. um, after the, the abdication crisis of 1936. So... His father was George V. He took George uh, for his um, name when he became king. And Edward VIII was was David, wasn't he? And Edward VIII was David, exactly. Um, so um, there's a lot of speculation. What will Charles do? He won't be Charles III because Charles I had his head chopped off, and Charles II was a, a you know Roman Catholic womanizer. Why would he want to be a Charles? Well, look, he got given the name Charles. I rather suspect he'll keep it. Not least because I think there's going to be a lot of debate when the change happens about why we have a monarchy and why it exists mm. and what's the point of it and mm. why don't we potentially get rid of it. Um, I think if you're going to change your name at age, whatever you will be, 71, 75, 80, whatever he'll be then, I think a lot of people say, that's a bit odd. Um, I've known him as Charles for all his life. Why has he suddenly changed his name? So they're going to have enough trouble with the sort of continuity in the transition without having to explain why he's changed his name. Personally, I think we'll have King Charles III. Mm. He is not as visible as his sons, is he? Um, you, whichever way you look at it, they have youth and glamour and, and mm. these, you know, lots of babies and attractive children. As a, he is not such uh, a, a media-friendly figure well, in many he, ways. Is that a problem for him? Well, uh, yes. I mean, you say not as visible, um, but he works hard and he is always out and about at work. He is, but he's not so reported upon. He's not. He's less reported upon. Correct. For example, um, he did a very important uh, tour to Germany recently. It mm. was actually meant to be the first tour after Brexit. It turned out to be the sort of the tour <laughs> when Brexit hasn't quite happened. Yeah. Anyway, he went to Germany. He met the Chancellor, Angela Merkel. He made a speech about Brexit. It was a very, very important visit. We were going to go and cover it. Harry and Meghan had a baby. Uh, so, yes. you know, th there's only so much news that, y you know, you can cover. As you know, um, you present the evening news. There's a finite amount of time. Oh. You have to decide stories on merit and, you know, what you're going to put in that bulletin. Um, clearly, in that week, the baby won. Mm. Um, that was inevitable. And I don't think anyone, um, I don't think there's any, uh, no one has any issue with that within the palace. It's, 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 a, it's a moment to celebrate. Yes. However, I think that's symptomatic of the slightly wider problem that, that Charles and Camilla have is that they're, they're, they're less... Um, they're, they're less media friendly, they're, they're not less accessible. They're, they're very happy for us to go on their tours. They're very happy for us to report on what they do. And I will say one thing about when you go on tour with them, they are very friendly. They're very approachable, probably the most approachable of all of them, actually. Um, they're very welcoming. They're grateful that you've come to, to, to cover their tours. Um, and they're, they're a lot of fun, actually, because, um, you know, rather than standing behind a piece of rope, you're allowed to get a lot closer. Um, it's a lot more relaxed. And what I see of Charles and Camilla close up is they do have an 
a fantastic rapport with people. Uh, I remember once a couple of years ago being in Romania with him and he was, one moment he'd had a meeting with some high priest and the next minute he was at a children's hospice talking to children with sort of terminal illnesses and, and with, with both those sets of people, he was, we was fantastic. I don't think it translates particularly well on the TV sometimes. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's maybe something they have to address going forward. But if, if, you, um, if anyone wants to watch a, a documentary, it happens to be on a, another broadcaster's channel, but um, there was a documentary in the autumn on the BBC about uh, Prince Charles at 70. And I personally thought that caught him um, in the most accurate way, the mm. sort of Prince Charles that we see when we're on the road. Uh, but I suppose if you were to ask anyone in the street out there, What's Prince Charles like? They'd probably say, oh, a little bit awkward, a bit stiff. It doesn't relate to Hugs people. trees. Although Hugs that's trees. come yeah. around his way, hasn't it? I'm just well, thinking... Well, again, it's exactly. I mean, yeah. at the moment, we're talking about plastic bottles and trees and climate change. And he, you know, to be fair, I read a lot of his speeches uh, and they've got climate change in every single one yes. normally. But that's a big, big issue at the moment. And, and no one criticises David Attenborough for doing that. Um, and yet Prince Charles has been talking about these issues since the 1970s. But in terms of news, news punch, if yes. you like... Yeah. He's not such an easy sell to a, to a program exactly editor. How I, as exactly how I describe it, it's not such an easy sell. Yeah. And yet some, but you know, some some trips are really important. Um, the Cuba one, for example, w was very important. Some Northern trips, Ireland this week. Yeah, Northern Ireland this week. Mm. Or oh, he was in uh, he's in the Republic of Ireland as well, and that's a you know very big issue at the moment. Mm. And he, he always every time I've been to Ireland with Prince Charles, he always speaks very very fondly of it. I mean, despite the painful memories that he's got of what happened to his um, great uncle Lord Louis Mountbatten there mm. in nineteen seventies. Um, but he always speaks very fondly uh, of, of Ireland and Northern Ireland. The trips are very carefully calibrated because clearly they have to be when, when you go there. And as we all know, Ireland is a, is a huge part of the Brexit story as well at the moment. Yeah. And that's why they, and the royals are often used as, as soft power to go and um, project you know, a hand of friendship, if you like, abroad, be that in Ireland or be that in Germany, as he did recently, um, be that last year when we went to Jerusalem with uh, Prince William, which was quite a historic visit itself, because royals have always avoided that tricky subject yeah. as well, about the uh, issue of Israel and Palestine. So Yeah, but they, they, they get in there and they, mm. you know, cover the ground, as we were talking about earlier, and sort of mental health and, and, and so on. So there, you know, objectively, there is a lot of good that they do, I think, most people can agree. I mean, well, I, I think mental health is a really good example. Yeah. I mean, rewind three, four years, and people would be ashamed to talk about mental health. Yeah. The, the fact that Harry, um, you know, kicked this all off with William and Kate, and they he did a podcast, spoke about how he sought professional help after the death of his mum. Sort of, you know, talked about his own problems. And I, I remember talking to Harry at the time um, about it, and I said to him. This is this is not right. Royals don't do this. You don't talk about your mental health. You know, Granny wouldn't talk about her mental health. We never know what the Queen thinks about anything. And yet um, his reply, I thought, was quite telling. It was like, if I can help one other person by talking about my own issues, then that's my way of doing duty and service. That's my way of giving back. And that's, uh, you know, the mental health issue, I think, encapsulates the way in which the Royals can bring attention to an issue. And if they can talk about it, well, Maybe so can everybody else. I just w want to return before before we wind up. It's really interesting stuff, but we can't can't go on forever. Um, I want to return to this idea of of social media and where you know mainstream media, traditional media, can fit into that. We've seen this week with the Chelsea Flower Show yep. and um, Meghan and Harry released a video on Instagram of, of a year's anniversary and mm -hmm. lovely pictures of their wedding. And the Cambridges had their, all their children out in force, looking gorgeous and. Charles and Camilla were in Ireland, not yes. getting so much attention. And, and there's the American media are now really involved as well. This, it's not getting simpler, your job. It's getting more complicated. No, I think yes? that was, I mean, there, there was an example. So you look at last Sunday. It happens to be the first anniversary of um, Harry and Meghan. It also happened to be the start of the Chelsea Flower Show where Kate had designed this garden and it was all about, you know, getting kids outside, an issue that she's passionate about. If you talk about, you know, we were talking about mental health for all the Invictus Games for Harry. If you're going to, say, identify an issue about which Kate is most passionate, it is uh, child development, getting early kids years, outside, yeah. early years and the rest of it. So that was a really big deal for her. The fact she allowed her three children to be filmed in the garden uh, shows you how much she wanted to bring attention to this issue and, and give it that publicity. 
But then you've got people saying, "Oh, look, they're competing against one another. One's trying to get out there. Kind of look like they're, that. They're, they're wedding it? photos on Instagram. One's trying to get on the front pages for, for by getting their kids out. You know, we've got lovely wedding pictures. You've got three beautiful kids. Um, and as you say, Prince Charles and Camilla on a very important trip to Ireland. Also getting M meanwhile, parents. meanwhile, the Sussex Sussexes are saying how noxious and toxic social media well, is. So it's. And there, 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 is, the there is a difficult is balance they've got going forward, mm. I think, because um, w the whole debate around the Sussex baby before Archie was born was that Harry and Meghan wanted it to be as private as possible. They didn't want to tell us home, birth or hospital. If it was going to be a hospital, they didn't want to tell us where it was. We had to wait for the birth certificate to find that out. Um, they didn't want to talk about who the, who the medical team were. They wanted the minimum amount of information out there. Now, a lot of people would rightly say they're entitled to that. Mm. It's, it's a very private family moment having a baby. The difficult path they've got to tread going forward is that if you're going to put Archie, a photo of Archie's feet onto Instagram where you have 8 million followers, um, you, you know, where is the line between we want privacy for our family and we're going to share bits of the journey with you and that's a really difficult line to tread and i think that's where critics are uncomfortable isn't it because there is the argument there is the suggestion that we're being mucked around with we're being manipulated they want us when they want us and they don't want us when they don't want us yeah and, and to be fair you know we are able to to, to bring attention to to, to causes and, and therefore i think they do want us to come along to those sort of things but do, does that therefore mean that the press have the right to talk about their personal relationships or whether mm. or not they're getting on with their dad or, you know, what they had for dinner last night? I mean, what, what level do you stop that? Yeah. You know, what's, you know, where do you stop between what is public and what is private? And but that line is a very difficult it's line. Very difficult. Navigate. And Princess Diana found that very difficult. And it's even more difficult now in this social media I completely agree, age. Yeah. And then Meghan's friends speak out in a documentary on, on US television which again is mainstream media, yeah, but again, you know, was I mean, that sanctioned? Was that not sanctioned? There's a it's big debate muddy, about American it? media as well, because obviously, you know, uh, uh, Megan is American. She, yes. was, she was born there. Her mum's American, her dad's American. And there was a, a huge amount of, well, I say huge amount of controversy. Maybe it was only in, in a, uh, un, under the surface in our level, but when they brought in a, a camera from CBS mm. to, to film, uh, the, film the baby. To be fair, I think the palace invited a lot of criticism for no real gain there. We already had two cameras from UK broadcasters. We all picked straws out of the hat. It happened to go to it's Sky It's called a News. pool, isn't it? It's and everyone pool. shares. And yeah. everyone shares it. So everyone would have got the picture, no matter who filmed it. It didn't matter whose camera, whether it was our camera, the BBC's or Sky's. It wouldn't matter. Everyone got that picture. It just happened that Sky uh, won that pool effectively that day. We, 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 I'll let you into a secret here. We got straws into a hat and we say, can you pick one out? And, you know, is that how it works? Exactly how Fantastic. it works. We got the press associate. So the guy who did the interview, we asked him to pick straws out to see who would be the broadcast camera. Um, Who's Alan Jones, but, is that Yeah, true? Alan Jones from the Press Association. Um, and he was in the studio talking to us recently. But, you know, I don't think anyone cares about that. It was just, really? a, it was just a camera, uh, or two cameras filming the baby. What um, Team Sussex did the day before was bringing a third camera because they thought the US network should be involved and it was a CBS camera. I can't tell you how they chose CBS or why NBC didn't get it or ABC mm. or CNN didn't get it. I don't know that. But a third camera was brought in and then there was a, an, another sort of wave of criticism about why Meghan was bringing in an American camera Listen, and the timing in time for the US well, breakfast again, shows and all that. Well, stuff. again, I mean, listen, I mean, th th they won't ever say that. But I mean, it, it, both the baby announcement and the um, pictures of Archie were both timed for around about midday in the UK, which is around about seven o'clock in America, which is when uh, the big American breakfast shows, um, the Today Show, or Good mm. Morning America, or CBS's is called This Morning. They all go on air at that time. No, listen. Who knows? No one, no one said to us <laughs> that was what they were doing, but um, they, you know that's what happened, and that was the time. It so a few British noses out of joint in in in, in the royal pack, if you like. I think there was because you know, this is the British royal family. Uh, they are funded. You know, everyone says they're funded by the taxpayer. Mm. I mean, that's a, a moot point. But you know, they're funded by the Duchy of Lancaster or the Duchy of Cornwall mm. or whatever else by by land in this country, um, and therefore I think that sort of there were there were. There was an argument in the British press pack that actually it should be the British media that covers the British royal family, not the American media. But again, this is, I think, where, as we spoke about earlier, where Meghan is being a disruptor. Um, and th there are many pluses to that. Um, and there are also 
that does invite some criticism as well. Mm. And a final thought, as the royal family are funded, as you say, is it by the British taxpayer or is it Dutchies? Various, but but they, we, we as uh, as British citizens need to like them. Don't we need to approve of them and be favourable towards them? They need to. I'm arguing, not my point of view necessarily, but just subjectively, they need to retain a good relationship with the British public. Well, they no? only exist um, at the request, if you like, um, of the British public. Yeah. Um, and were there to be, I know referendum's a bit of a um, <laughs> difficult Please, word. Please, not another referendum. <laughs> were there to be um, another referendum on, um, you know, on the, mon on the monarchy, people would, would vote however they want to vote. I mean, a lot of the polls show it's around about 25% of people in this country don't want a monarchy, 75% do. Mm. I mean, th those polls have been fairly consistent, to be fair, over the last 50 or 60 years. Um, but yes, they exist um, at the, the request of the British public. So therefore, I think they need to be relatable. And a lot, that's what a lot of people say about William and Harry, is how they've, you know, that new generation makes them much more relatable to, to different people. And I distinctly remember going down to uh, Brixton in South London when, uh, before Harry and Meghan were, were married, but they were going around various parts of the country. Mm. And, the, you know, it's a very mixed community. And, and there was, um, a, a woman said to me there, do you know what, if the Queen had come to this visit, I wouldn't have bothered to turn up for her. But the fact that Meghan came, I came. And she said, you know, this, this, she is making the royal family much more relatable to me and much more relatable to my community in a way in which it never was before. Relevant. In, so, in, in and and relevant. And we'll come back century. to that point of relevance. So, yeah. you know, um, you can say that, that uh, all that, all that difference that Meghan brings into the royal family, um, well, there's one very important positive for the royal family in terms of connecting with all sections of society, not just a particular section. So I tell you what, whatever your view, it's a really interesting brief, right? Well, exactly. So it's just like, <laughs> <laughs> hence why I do it. So um, well, it's lovely know. talking to you. Thank you so much, Pleasure. Chris. Really interesting. <laughs>